uh, just thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about the Canadian Dam Association and what it does. The CDA is a well-organized volunteer organization and has a presence in all provinces and territories in Canada. Mo majority of the members are engineers, and but there are many non-engineers that contribute to CDA's work. And more recently, we are trying uh, to attract the insurance industry and risk managers into, into our thinking group. A CDA is leaned upon by all dam regulators in Canada, and I, and I underline all dam regulators. In Nova Scotia, CDA's many documents are viewed as guidelines only, but in other jurisdictions of Canada, adherence to CDA work is mandatory. There are more than 100 dam organizations in, in globally in the world, and CDA is among the top 10. In fact, it's probably in the top five. We have about 8,500 to 9,000 dams in Canada. My information tells me that Nova Scotia, we have about 650 dams. They exist in all 18 counties. 150 dams, more or less, are owned by Nova Scotia Power. 350 by municipally owned. I, I can't I put a slide up this because these, this information is 10 years old and I don't want to mislead anybody, but you're getting you're getting a sense of what we have in, in Nova Scotia. So 350 municipally owned, 50 in industry. Uh, Minus, in fact, owns 15 and I and I, I'll lean here a bit. So the, one of our dams is behind me on the screen. We have uh, dams on two river systems. Uh, 40 dams are in uh, provincial and federal government hands. So that's about 600. Others, uh, dam belong to, dams belong to Ducks Unlimited and the remainder are either abandoned or orphaned. So our, our inventory is not insignificant. The CDA helps in all areas, either formal training, learning from colleagues, attending conferences or workshops, either online or in person. In fact, we had a, a, an online session in, in March and we had 700 plus applicants. It was a successful learning experience. And you can also learn by volunteering in one of the many uh, committees of CDA. A typical conference setting, uh, there it is, pictures of it. You've been to them before, you've seen them. It, it, the attendees mix mix, and they share their experiences. The top left corner, maybe back up, top left corner are four of Canada's most uh, dam experts and, and known across Canada and known internationally. The bottom right is a typical workshop where everybody crowds around a table. Workshops are always oversubscribed. They're always crowded and they're full of uh, just full of enthusiasm. They learn from each other. Uh, I'm told by the people in my office here that there's not Prince Harry at, the, in, at that table. Right? A typical, uh, so a finally a word on the CDA's upcoming conference. It's in Winnipeg. It's, uh, it's balanced, its title is Balancing Past Performance with Future Expectations. This was postponed from 2020 and now goes virtual in nine days time. The organizers have been working on this conference for three years. There's been a lot of work in it. It's got great content, great value for those who register and registration includes your annual membership fee. And the conference in 2022 next year will be live in St. John's, the very finest. Chris, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, Beth. Um, Today we are going to discuss, you know, why why we chose to do a potential failure mode analysis at the Bishop's Falls hydroelectric project. Uh, part of this discussion will be what exactly is potential failure mode analysis. I'm, I'm sure not everybody has heard the term or is familiar with uh, conducting a failure mode analysis. Uh, it's something that was developed long ago. Um, by the Army, the U.S. Army, uh, it's used in the airline industry, um, but uh, the dam industry incorporated it back in the late 60s or the 70s, uh, and it's developed quite a bit since then. Um, the process used to do the PFMA for, for Bishop's Falls, we'll, we'll go over that. We'll discuss the results of the PFMA, and we are going to uh, Look at the owners takeaway. You know what? What did they get out of this? Um, and the lessons learned, obviously. So brief project description. Um, now for energy um, took over management of the hydroelectric facilities uh, on the Exploits River in 2009. Uh, this is in Newfoundland, central Newfoundland. The Exploits River uh, has a total catchment area of about 11,000 square kilometers. The river itself 
is approximately 175 kilometers long um, with a, a width of 120 meters to 450 meters. So she, she can get pretty wide in some places. Um, the Bishop's Fault project is, is the last dam downstream on the river. Um, and it has a, a significant hazard classification. And they've got that hazard classification not due to population at risk or loss of life, but due to environmental impacts and uh, to the Atlantic salmon in, in the river. And that's, that becomes a little important later. Um, a lot of potential fair mode analyses are, are done on higher hazard dams or dams where um, life uh, is at risk. Um, but it was done here um, uh, at a significant hazard dam, partly to, to uh, educate the operators, educate the new owners uh, on what the, uh, the operations of the site are and what they were paid for. And, and we'll, Get into that in more detail going forward. Um, it's a run of river operation, and the hydro has control of about 50% of the watershed uh, through managing the storage. Um, the project, if you guys can see this, uh, consists of a concrete gravity dam, which is basically a big block of concrete shaped to pass river flows. It has an Amberson Dam, which on the outside has a similar shape, uh, but an Amberson Dam is a slab on buttress design, and in between the buttresses or in between piers, it's hollow. Um, there's a gated spillway right here. This gated spillway was added after the 1983 flood, where the main earthen embankment dam failed. It overtopped and failed. Um, in 83, and following that, some studies were done, and they added the gated spillway to increase spillway capacity, increase flood uh, passing capability. There is a four bay dam and gates. This allows them to dewater the four bay to do work on the intake structure. Um, the powerhouse located here, the main embankment dam, which we mentioned, and then of course the wind dam. The wind dam will come up here uh, as we do the uh, PFMA session. So, why did Newfoundland Hydro choose to do a potential failure move at Bishop's Falls? Well, they wanted to ensure the dam safety requirements um, were being met. You know, they, they followed the CBA guidelines, uh, and they wanted to better understand the operations and the operations personnel were involved in the PFMA session. Uh, and it really gave them a better understanding of why it's operated the way it is, what the operational constraints are, and what that means as far as impacts to the dam, uh, what the hazards could potentially be if something is not operated properly. Um, it highlights the relationship between dam safety and operational requirements. And uh, Hydro had a, a desire to fine tune the existing monitoring and surveillance plan. Um, and they were able to do that through the PFMA findings. All right, if I'm looking over to my side every once in a while, so I'm just going to check the chat to make sure there's no questions. So, preparation before a PFMA workshop. So, it's important to understand. Of going into a workshop, but there's a lot of data, a lot of reports that you have to gather and put together um, to effectively do a failure mode analysis. Uh, so you're going to pull together all your past reports, study, analysis drawings, construction history, um, photos. These are all really important things to, to know and understand, really get understanding how this thing was built. Um, and what the limitations are. Stability, bridge analysis, um, these all become um, very important factors. Um, current monitoring plans, uh, Bishop's had more than 30 reports and 160 drawings. Uh, that sounds like a lot, it is a lot, uh, but many facilities have much more. Some have much less, and facilities that have less data uh, can be problematic if you don't have the answers during the workshop. You end up with a lot of um, failure modes that you can't 
classified at the end of the day. Uh, you have to go out and find the lab. Uh, the lead engineers and the facilitator, facilitator at a minimum uh, should thoroughly review all the background data. All members, members should review the background data to become familiar with the site. Um, it's encouraged that folks take a fresh look at the data. So you'll have operators that have been there for a long time. Uh, it's encouraged uh, before the session that they review it and make sure they understand where some of this stuff is coming from. That fresh look. Um, and, and look at it with a critical eye. Uh, going into these sessions, it's good to have a good based background understanding of the data so that you're not trying to find things during the session. So preparation before the PFMA, besides all that data, we are looking at resources and methods. So there are different guidelines for doing a potential failure analysis. The CDA has uh, existing uh, guidance uh, in the guidelines. Uh, it's currently being reworked. Uh, there is a uh, committee uh, working on PFMA guidance uh, currently within the CDA. Uh, so we should expect to see something out new. I'm not quite sure what the timeline is there. Uh, the FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in the United States, has very prescriptive guidelines on how to perform and write uh, a PFMA. Um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, probably between them and the USVR, they've they've had uh, guidelines for PFMA and risk for, for quite some time. And then, of course, there's ASDSO, USSD, and ICOL all have uh, various documentation resources that you can pull from. Yes, a feel for it. We went through all this to get uh, an understanding of what we felt would be right for official support. The time requirements, documentation, and then goals. We did follow um, kind of a merger between the FERC guidelines and the CDA in order to perform both the PFMA and, and right up to the report afterwards. The assembling a, the PFMA team, this is also pretty critical. It's, it's not a small team. Ideally, you're going to have a facilitator. You can have a note taker, somebody who's dedicated to recording with the session. Uh, and then you're going to have your consultants, your subject matter experts, whether they be civil, structural, geotech, uh, hydrotechnical. Um, a lot of things come into play. Mechanical, electrical, there's a lot of gate and operations that need to be understood. Um, and then project personnel, operations, project engineers. Um, for bishops, we had 14 people uh, participate in the workshop. Um, having good room, you know, room with ability to spread out, ability to take breaks, uh, spread out your snacks, room for flip charts, all that stuff is important. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but um, often you go to a hydro facility, there's not going to be uh, a nice room at the plant. So plan on you know, going to a local hotel and doing a site visit. You know, reviewing the facilities and then going back to that hotel conference room to conduct the PFMA. And then conducting the PFMA day one. Now we we did this PFMA over just a couple days, um, and you have to start with uh, guidance for for the group. If you're the facilitator, you need to set some ground rules. Um, you identify and develop a good understanding of the PFMs for the water retaining structures at Bishop's Falls, you're going to provide guidance on, on how, how you're going to do that. Um, you're going to try to develop appropriate risk reduction measures to mitigate those PFMs, it's kind of goal. Um, and you're going to help fine tune the existing dam safety program um, based on uh, what you find as uh, weaknesses in the site or things that can become better to monitor um, potentially high hazard areas or areas of concern. Um, you're going to get your room set up for people show up. It's all uh, obvious. Uh, you're going to do a site visit. 
Uh, we walked the site. Uh, we had six participants in this. Not everybody was able to participate in the, the site visit. Uh, but you're going to walk the site. You're going to make sure everybody has an understanding beyond just drawing some pictures of what the site is, how it's laid out, how to put together. And then we went back to the meeting space to review the data and discuss the observations. Uh, sometimes when you're out there, you'll, you'll find items that need to be addressed, uh, certain weaknesses. Um, and I'll use bishops as an example. We went out there, we looked at the main dam, we looked at the wing dam, and we noticed the wing dam, even though the drawings indicate that they are the same elevation, test elevation, they were not. The wing dam is actually lower. Uh, and that becomes uh, an issue that becomes over popping. Um, day two workshop, we had everybody on site. You know, the facilitator, which was me, uh, started by you know, reiterating the goal statements, uh, presenting a process and expectations for the day. Um, spent time discussing how to develop the PFM, set ground rules. You know, many in attendance didn't know what a PFM was, didn't know what formal PFM process looked like. Um, and many of you, many of you out there may not know. So, uh, potential failure mode can be described as a, a specific chain of events leading to a failure. In this case, a dam failure. Uh, we had to define what a failure was, um, and in this case, we define failure as an uncontrolled release of the impoundment. Um, it does not need to be a catastrophic failure. It doesn't need to be a complete blowout. It just has to be an uncontrolled release. Uh, and then we talk about consequences and, and likelihoods uh, as part of that categorization. Um, ideally, a PFMA workshop would be done over several days. Um, we, we did the initial site visit and, and work on day one, and we did everything else on day two. Uh, we found that to be pretty tight in this case. That, that would not be normal. We would normally stretch it out over several days. Uh, and this is to give you time to discuss each failure mode in detail to review the data and really understand um, what the impacts of a flood would be. What's the likelihood of the flood? What's the likelihood that that flood might overtop the dam, the bank the dam? But what are the chances that a gate might not open? Uh, what's the gate's building capacity what's of each gate? You know, having some of this basic data uh, beforehand really helps speed things along. Uh, but there is some figuring out that's done during the session, almost inevitably. I haven't done one. I've been doing PFMA since 2004, but I haven't gone to one yet where we haven't spent some time during the session um, looking at data. So again, this comes back to having quick reference data readily available. You know, encourage people to ask questions or speak up if data does not match what they think the value should be. You know, that happens quite a bit. The operators have an idea of what something should be, but the drawings don't match or the report doesn't match. Um, and then you spend time reviewing the data. Uh, and we try not to blindly accept that that is correct. So having some of this worked out before the session really helps speed things along. Uh, we have many discussions around elevations, uh, which is common, specifically around the wind dam, as I mentioned before. The Canadian Dam Association has a failure mode to matrix. Um, and you can, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going through this, um, but, uh, you have global failure mode where there's dam collapse by overtopping, erosion or overturning, or dam collapse by loss of strength. So an easy one to describe would be a dam collapse by overtopping. Um, maybe you have inadequate stall discharge capacity, meaning you have an inflow design flood or a hundred year flood comes along. And your gates or your spillway doesn't actually have the capacity to spill the water that's coming at it. So the water continues to rise um, until that flow is achieved. Um, 
if you don't have the capacity, you may end up overtopping an earthen embankment. An earthen embankment does not tolerate overtopping um, to much degree. So it's generally accepted if you're going to have overtopping for any length of time, more than a foot in depth over earthen embankment, uh, you're going to assume that embankment is going to eventually fail. And so you get into uh, those discussions and, and the process of how the failure initiates, progresses, and then ultimately uh, an uncontrolled release happens. So for bishops, we chose to uh, tackle potential failure modes uh, structure by structure. Uh, and we started with the gated spillway. Um, it's just a way of organizing, you know, how to go. So you're not jumping from one structure to another structure, foundation to operational, geotechnical to structural. You pick one structure, work through the different uh, potential failure modes for that structure. Uh, we assess you know, the various failure modes for a particular structure and took time to exhaust possibilities before moving on to, to another structure. Uh, we could have arranged it by load condition. So we could have done all the normal pond failure modes, seismic failure modes, flood failure modes, and went through structures that way. Uh, but we chose to go with structure. Describing a potential failure mode. Um, first, you got to stay open minded and positive while you're, you're having these sessions. You know, talk it through and everybody gets a say. And kind of try to come to a consensus to what you think this failure mode should look like and how it's going to be worded. It's very important to write a detailed description of the failure mode from initiation. How does it start through how it ends, how you lose control of your water? Um, so again, initiator, failure progression, uh, resulting failure impacts. So as an example, I pulled up uh, failure mode number one for this, this facility. And as you can see, it's, it's fairly well detailed. Uh, the picture to the left is the actual chart we use. So as a facilitator, I'm taking notes. I'm putting on a chart for everybody to see in the session. Um, and then we have a note taker who's, who's writing this down, but also expanding on it. And when you go do the report, you should have something like this. And it can be more wordy than this. You can add more detail. Um, but eventually, you should have an understanding of how this starts. So in this case, for failure mode number one, it was uh, based on uh, significant ice building up on the gates uh, and in the guides of one or more gates sufficient to prevent gate operation. Now it's important to note that this PFM, they've had this happen before. Uh, they've had the inability to open a gate in the past due to ice issues. And so this is something they jumped on right at the kick, right from day one, right? They wanted to, to discuss this as a what's the hazard associated with this. Um, so in this case, you know, the head pond then rises uncontrolled as flood flow exceeds the spillway capacity and several gates close. Flashboards over the Amberson Dam spillway fail as designed. Uh, but the spillway capacity is still not sufficient to pass the flood if they figure the spillway and the head pond continues to rise. We put in a little detail, the spillway deck is over top of 15.09, inhibiting any further gantry train operation. All the gates are operated by a single gantry train. Um, head pond continues to rise until the wing dam is over top at about elevation 16 meters. But overtopping of the wing dam cannot be relied on to provide enough flow to prevent overtopping of the main dam. So overtopping the wing dam may increase spillage capacity, you may equalize out, but we decided not to rely on that. And at the dam or the on elevation would continue to rise. Uh, so it rises until it overtops the main embankment at 16.5. At that point the embankment begins to erode. The downstream face. Pressed in the embankment erodes until the embankment becomes unstable 
and failed to result in the land control release of the water. We can add a lot more detail to that, uh, but that captures the essence. After you've described the failure mode, then you do an assessment of the failure mode. You know, what, what makes this more likely or less likely? What, what's the relevant data associated with that failure mode? Um, freezing of the gates, leading to the inability to operate a gate has happened before, so that's important to note. The number of gates unable to open, gate and flash port spillway capacities, uh, flood flow will influence how much or how fast the pond will rise. Uh, the breakdown of the numbers and operations is critical to understanding the PFM and how operations can be impacted uh, and to understand the severity of what can happen and, and how. Um, we were unable to fully work out all these numbers during the session, and it was done after the fact during the report preparation. Uh, it is better to try to get this done during the PFM session. Uh, so all can get a better feel for the PFM during the session. Again, it's back to preparation for, for that section. Make sure everybody has the data and have some cheat sheets. Um, so you get your single gate, your, your inflow spillway capacity, IDF flow. Um, for those not familiar, uh, inflow design flow, uh, which can vary from site to site depending on how the classification and such. I'm going into details on how that's developed. Um, an important takeaway here was that during an IDF event, an inflow design flood, the loss of up to three gates was not likely to result in the overtopping of the main abatement. Uh, because of project capacity, um, you would need to lose uh, four or more gates. So there's lots of redundancy there that prevent overtopping the main abatement. It's kind of a takeaway there. When we talk about consequences, you know, understanding the consequences is an important um, part of understanding the PFM, and, and later it can be used in developing a risk assessment. I'm not going to go into a discussion on risk assessments, um, but potential failure mode is, is certainly uh, the leading part of doing a risk assessment, knowing what your failure mode is, talk about your uh, likelihood of a failure and the consequences of the failure to, to do a risk assessment. We've certainly done this as well. Um, but today we're concentrating on ferry modes. Um, so here, consequences of embankment breaching was financial costs, of course, loss generation, reconstruction costs. Um, it got a significant hazard classification due to environmental uh, considerations and tree damage. Uh, flooding the downstream river and substantially lowering the pit pond water level. Uh, there's always the reputation, public perception that the, the owner would, would see. Um, but there was no occupied structure in Australia except for the tower house. And uh, there's nothing you can expect to be impacted uh, based on inundation maps. So dam breach studies were done. So they have inundation maps to know if there is a breach, what possible uh, inundated areas are going to look like. Uh, and it's also assumed that during a flood, um, there's no big fishing downstream. The water level is already high, even without uh, a dam break. So it's going to be done. You develop a failure mode summary. Failure to open gates during flood due to icing on spill gates. So you come up with a nice little table, summarize everything, failure, uh, conditions that make it more likely and conditions that make it less of like positive factors. Um, so for here, unlikely the positive factor, you know, the gain heaters, you have agitators in front of the gates, um, operations jog the gates to make sure they're free and moving daily you know, during the season, make sure they don't freeze up. Um, and it's four or more gates are required to be effective before this becomes an issue. So they have a lot going for them. Um, the adverse factors, you know, winter mild spell can free up the ice sheets. Um, gate not opening due to icing has happened before, so they know it can be an issue. Um, flood flows and, and failure of the embankment has happened before. 
Uh, so it's not something you take lightly. And a uh, procedure for, for jogging the gates. So over here in the positive factors, we had noted that the operations jog the gates daily to make sure that they're loose and free. However, you know, that came up talking with operators who were taking part of the session. It wasn't documented anywhere. So there's no operational procedure for doing this. Uh, they couldn't prove it in writing that they do it other than they say that they do it. So that becomes a takeaway. Um, and then we had a, a classification, which I'll talk about next, you know, how we classify this as category one. And this was a, you know, a bit of a debate on whether or not it should be a category one. We'll explain that in the next slide. Uh, but they have a reason here that there is a history of gate freezing in the closed position, and the gate of spillway is required to pass large floods, which makes this uniform possible. And that was a primary reason for both category one. Um, and then they put in some risk reduction measures, including you know, moving the gates to keep them loose, reinstating a bubbler system uh, that they hadn't been using, and um, uh, creating documented procedures for PIC, keeping the gates loose and uh, freezing or freezing in the closer gates. EFM's classification. So these categories are more or less based on FERC classification, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which has very specific guidelines on this type of thing. Um, and this is summarized. So category one are high energy PFMs. PFMs that you really want to pay attention to, those PFMs of greatest significance considering the need for awareness, uh, potential for occurrence, magnitude of consequence, and likelihood of adverse uh, response. But, you know, we know that this is physically possible to happen. Um, so we highlighted to make sure uh, they're doing all they can to, to mitigate it. Now, category one PFM does not mean that this is a high risk PFM, so it could be, but the probability and consequence uh, are there to, to justify the category one. So the likelihood of occurrence is there enough for the category one, enough for them to want to pay attention to this. Uh, category twos are, are considered but not highlighted. Uh, they're judged to be less significant, um, less likely to occur, maybe. Easily. Category three, basically, you don't have enough information to classify it. Uh, and this happens a lot. If you don't have studies in place, if you don't have flood elevations, you don't have stability analysis, if you don't have mitigation mapping, maybe you don't have enough information to classify the category. And so you get a category three. Uh, and then category four, the PFM is ruled out. You know, it's ruled out because it's physically not possible to happen or information came to light which eliminated the concern. And we'll keep it at that. For Bishop's Fall, we had a summary of PFMs. Um, we had 21 potential failure modes. We had two that were category one. Um, both related to uh, gate operational failure. Uh, one due to icing, and the second one was due to the cancer failure. Um, I didn't put in a detailed discussion on this one, but essentially, um, the gantry crane, they had one gantry crane required to open the gates. They had a mechanical electrical failure of that crane. Then theoretically, they can't open any gates. Uh, that would be a problem, depending on the nature of the failure and how fast they can get it fixed. Um, they had nine category two, five category three, and uh, five category four. Again, just highlighting this, these category three just highlights the need to understand um, the data and what's available. Um, it's also important to talk about items that were discussed but not developed. Um, so we discussed a few things, but we didn't fully develop them. Um, we discarded it as not possible uh, for various reasons. It's important to document them, even if you're not going to go forward through the full process so that 
future reviewers, future engineers, future operations personnel, uh, if they ask the question, you know, was the foundation considered? Um, foundation failure is, is a pretty common failure. Um, they would want to know, was it at least discussed? If it was, why was it ruled out? Uh, here it was discussed, it was ruled out. We have pretty good information on the foundation conditions. Um, really good law. And we weren't worried about uh, any kind of uh, slip plane, crushing, uh, seismic issues, whatever, with that foundation. So we rolled it out. And we also talked about the four bay gate structure. If you remember, there's a, a gate structure in front of the powerhouse. We talked about it, but we ruled it out because it's a failure of that does not result in an uncontrolled release of the river. It just results in their inability to control the, the four bay line uh, in front of the powerhouse. A failure of the powerhouse would result in uncontrolled release of the river, uh, and that is uh, one of the things. Now, Hydra is not here to talk about this part of it, but uh, I permission to, to say a few words. You know, their hydropower production engineers and operation personnel did gain a better understanding of the dam's vulnerabilities and operational impacts on dam safety. Um, this process helped the production engineers justify implementing certain dam safety measures. Um, they came away with a report documenting and detailing the PFMs and mitigating measures. And um, they, they had a, a clear path forward on how to update and improve their surveillance and monitoring plan. They found great value in the PFM process. Lessons learned. Um, there was a significant amount of documentation, studies, reports, and, and drawings for the project. And I think I've mentioned it several times. You know, the data, the documentation is, is critical. And, and having that summarized early, going into the PFMA session with that knowledge, it is critical to having a successful PFMA session to understand the various aspects of the project. Uh, more time to conduct the PFMA workshop. Now, in this place, the, the client is just had limited availability of the team and they did this stuff that they wanted to get done. So we did what we could to, to do in a short amount of time. Um, but the takeaway from all involved would be uh, it would, would have been nice to have more time uh, to work through some of these values and really discuss them out. Again, more detailed cheat sheets comes back to the data aspect. Uh, and there were a few data gaps found during the workshop uh, and data review studies that hindered development of some of the PFMs. So having as many of these addressed before the PFMA would have helped. But obviously it's not always practical. Um, it's often the case that we're going to go into a PFMA session and not have all the data. And you may not know it. Uh, until you get in there and start talking about something and go, oh, it would be nice to know this, uh, but it's never been thought of before and never been considered necessary. So some of those takeaways are, are inevitable. Um, PFMA session, the client found it very useful in highlighting the vulnerabilities of the project. Again, this is a project that's relatively new to them. It's not something they've had in their portfolio very long, so they wanted to get a better understanding of it, and this is a great way to, to do that. Um, it also highlighted areas that were not a concern, areas where they don't need to spend much time uh, worrying about it. Uh, operation participation, you know, operation personnel was critical to understanding the history and operation of the site. Many of these Operation personnel had been there a very long time when they came to the project. Um, and this whole session helped operations gain better understanding of the site and why things were done the way they were done, um, why it was important to monitor hazometers as frequently as they were monitoring them, why it was important to monitor boat flow from the, the drainage boundaries, stuff like that um, comes out of it. 
that operations may not not always have a full understanding the, uh, of why what happens if you know water and a thermometer increases in a bank and they may not fully appreciate what the threshold and action level would be in that case and what could happen if, if it succeeded and that is it folks i don't see a single question but i'll open it up for questions Anybody? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat either, Chris. Um, it is open, so um, maybe we'll give it a few more seconds here to see if uh, any questions come in. Absolutely. Make John in his words. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I was. You were right. I owe you a loony. <laughs> Ellis, for sure. I thought you'd be answer, asking a question. Uh, Chris, have they repeated this on other sites? It seems like the Newfoundland Hydro, Labrador Hydro were were pleased with it. Have they have they repeated it? Uh, they did the first one last year. Uh, they have not repeated it yet, uh, but they are uh, considering the next site. Yes, because there must be other sites where they would like operators and and the engineers to be no, more knowledgeable. So they sounds to me like a pretty reasonable outcome here. Yeah, and, and I don't know that how common doing uh, potential failure mode analysis in, in Canada is yet. Um, in the States, it's a requirement. You know, back in 2004, they made it a requirement uh, for every high hazard, significant hazard site um, that was under their jurisdiction uh, went through a pre session. So every five years, but within five years, 10 years, they had every site in the US with that kind of hazard classification done. Now, every five years, those PFMAs get reviewed. Uh, in some cases, they get redone. But it is part of um, part of the process in the US. OK. <clears throat> um, somebody's asked, how many days did the workshop take? Um, two. Uh, there was one day that was basically a data review day and a site visit day. Um, we sometimes people don't have time to review the data beforehand, so it's nice to give them a day or half a day to, to kind of go through things, ask questions, and review that. And then you go to the site, kind of verify what the reports are they're telling you. And then the session itself was just the one day of the workshop to go through the three images, uh, which, in my opinion, and, and Everybody's opinion that day was it was too short of a time. Uh, it would have been better to have two or three days to go through that. And go through it, so. My final comment, sign up for the CDA conference. It's a great value. Uh, we have a question from Ellis. Is yeah. there a hazard with this approach creating tunnel vision, going down rabbit holes and spending less effort assessing the dam for other vulnerabilities? Absolutely. Um, and, and that's where the facilitator, a knowledgeable facilitator, really comes into play um, to try to avoid going down too many rabbit holes. Uh, and it does come up a lot. Um, facilitator at the front kind of has to provide some guidance, um, but not interject their opinion too heavily. Um, it really becomes a bit of a balance if you happen to be one of the more knowledgeable people in the room, but you want to pull, right? You're constantly pulling information from the crowd, getting them, the audience, the, the workshop attendees to really think about it, get them to give you the information, 
um, get them thinking about it. And, and but there is a tendency to start going down side paths or side trails, and, and you can get um, stuck going down a path that's not going to lead anywhere. Sometimes you have to uh, pull people back. Were the participants uh, engaged? Did they did they take an active interest in it, or, or did they be? What was their attitude? Did they have to be here, so yeah, we'll yawn and be quiet. So, no, uh, it, it was it was nice to see uh, the operations personnel were very interactive. Um, they had a, a lot to say. Um, they were they were knowledgeable in the site. Um, they had a lot of good questions. Um, some of them didn't. You know, they'd never seen a embankment stability diagram before or understood uh, why the visometers are there. All of these things haven't changed in 20 years. Why are we still monitoring them kind of thing? And so you get into those discussions to explain why you're still monitoring the visometers, even though they shouldn't change. And it's important for them to understand why, why these things have to happen. Uh, but yeah, we had good. Good participation by by everybody. Mm -hmm. Certainly makes it go easier. Um, I think facilitated some of these. Uh, if not getting good audience participation, it's going to be a painful few days. Yeah, I can see that. All right, that looks to be. I think. Um, the last of the questions for today. Um, I don't see anyone typing here, so um, I guess we'll wrap things up there. Thank you, Chris and John, for presenting today. Um, and thank you, everyone um, online for joining.